Coming up on DTNS, we wrap up CES 2022 week. Robert Heron's here to look at what we saw on TVs and home theaters, and Allison Sheridan identifies some of the most interesting announcements you didn't hear about elsewhere. DTNS starts now. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, January 7th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And this is Allison Sheridan of the Podfeed Podcast. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And as I mentioned, co-host of AVXL, Robert Heron's along with us. Hey, Robert. Hey, how are you guys? Good to, good, good good to see Good, good. Happy all. New Year. Good to see you. Thank you. Happy 2022. We were just all sharing our, our favorite YouTube channels uh, on Good Day Internet, and obviously we'll be talking more about the topics of CES on Good Day Internet. If you want that wider show, get it at patreon.com slash DTNS. Big, big thanks to our top patrons. Today they include Chris Benito, Steve Ayadarola, and Jeffrey Zilks. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. The Entertainment Software Association canceled its in-person E3 event this year, citing ongoing health risks. The ESA says it could not confirm whether or not there would be a digital event this year as well. Game monitors aren't new, curved monitors aren't new, but at CES, we got a curved game monitor that is not curved left to right, but instead top to bottom. Samsung hopes you find that interesting. It created the 55-inch 4K Odyssey Arc coming out in the second half of this year. That's about all the details we have on it so far. However, The Verge named it their pick for best in show at CES. At the health tech keynote at CES, Abbott CEO Robert Ford announced that the medical device maker is developing a new line of consumer biowearables called Lingo. The devices will be aimed at general fitness and wellness, able to track key signals in the body, such as glucose, ketones, and lactate, with alcohol levels potentially down the line. Microsoft added new features to the Power Toys suite. Always on top lets users pin any app to always be in front of other windows. Power Toys also added web search in the run launcher using a activation command to search the web. And the search will go to preferred search engine in your user's default browser. Samsung forecast its Q4 operating profit increased 52% on the year. That's up to 13.8 trillion won, which is about 11.4 billion U.S. dollars, although this would still miss analyst estimates. The company also estimates that it hit record quarterly revenue up 24% on the year to 76 trillion won. Samsung's contract chip manufacturing business is expected to see increased profit in the next quarter. The National Copyright Administration of China issued an order Thursday preventing digital music platforms from signing exclusive agreements in most cases. China's market regulator had already ordered Tencent to end all of its exclusive agreements last year for being anti-competitive. Other companies affected by this new order include Xiaomi, China Mobile, and NetEase. If you're wondering about Apple, they partner with Tencent, so they're already covered under that in China. And Spotify is not allowed to operate in China. Twitter began testing a new feature on iOS called Tweet Takes that will let users post a video reaction to tweets rather than a standard quote tweet. Probably reminds you of a different app, but no, we're talking about Twitter. Tweet Takes takes uh, places the tweet a user is responding to as a sticker that's placed over a vertical video. Yeah, about time they came up with that TikTok Twitter. Engadget, which awards the official Best of CES awards, gave the official Best in Show to the Chevy Silverado EV, GM's second fully electric model built on the Ultium Battery platform. Chevy Silverado RST, officially the model, promises a 400-mile range, fast charging of up to 100 miles of range per 10 minutes, 10.2 kilowatt hours of offboard power, uh, which you could use to run power tools at a work site uh, or home accessories if you had a power outage. It'll tow up to 10,000 pounds, carry up to 1,300 pounds of payload with an initial MSRP for the first edition. This is like the founder's edition of the truck of $105,000. If you're like, I just want to get one of the first ones, that will fall to a more expected $39,000 base price for the regular RST when that arrives in the summer of 2024. Dang. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Quite a price to be first. All right, let's start uh, with the news on Google and Sonos's little patent spat. Let's spat. do it. The United States International Trade Commission ruled that Google infringed on five audio technology patents held by Sonos related to controlling a group of speakers. The ruling would block Google from importing infringing products, including Nest Audio, Pixel phones, and Chromecast devices. 
lot of devices. Google responded by pushing out an ITC approved software downgrade that changes a few group speaker features. So users will have to adjust each speaker in a group's volume individually, whereas before they were nested. And some users will face issues if they haven't updated to the latest software. Google doesn't expect any impact on device imports or sales. Of course the company would say that. So instead of paying Sonos a license, Google has decided to remove functionality. That is not great if you're a Google customer, but that is something that the company decided to do. Ars Technica quotes one commenter on the Google Nest community as saying, quote, so you got sued by Sonos and we pay the price? Either get some better lawyers or win the suit or pay and win the suit or pay Sonos a royalty or start issuing refunds to customers, end quote. What do we think? Fair? Unfair? I mean... I think that's terrible. I mean, they have a choice, right? They're making it sound like their only decision. Well, well, you know, Sonos won't let us do it, so we have to take away the capability. And there's always a choice, right? They didn't want to spend the money to pay. And maybe they don't want to set a precedent making it look like they will pay. I don't know. I, I'm I'm on the side of the user there. It kind of reminds me of what went on recently between YouTube and Google. Or I'm sorry, <laughs> YouTube and, gosh, what was it? Uh, NBC Universal. Right where they where they took away ESPN from my YouTube TV app, um, and my mom was like, "Oh my gosh, this is horrible. How, how will we cope?" And I'm like, "They're gonna come to a resolution." I sort of see the same thing in this scenario. Robert, what about you? I just am kind of sad to see that they spent all this time just hashing out exactly what was owned by who when it should have been pretty clear right up front if you're adopting a feature for a product line. Mm. I, I'm curious to know how much the lawyers made in all of this when Probably and a lot. And why wouldn't Google just then just license that technology right from Sonos in order to have that continued functionality? I, I wonder why exactly it had to go this far. Uh, it's my job time. to ad advocate for the devil. So uh, first of all, Google does not expect any impact on device or imports or sales because they agreed with the ITC on the downgrade, right? They The ITC could ban them from importing, but Google's saying, we agreed with the ITC on this downgrade before we even pushed it. So we're confident that the ITC is not gonna stop us from bringing stuff in because we think we've gotten around it. Why didn't Google license it? Too expensive, maybe. What if Sonos is asking for a ridiculous amount of money for this and they just couldn't get them to, to bring a lower price? Maybe Google legitimately is like, we're not gonna pay that. Like that's it, that we would have to raise the price of all our Nest stuff. So we'd rather take away uh, the feature maybe. Didn't you say in the pre-show though, that uh, there was evidence that they were actually briefed on this by Sonos and then used it. Oh, so they knew not, they were not evidence. It? Google and Sonos did cooperate on some stuff and Sonos under NDA showed them uh, some features. Now, what Sonos is not accusing Google of is ripping off trade secrets and doing what they showed them. They haven't violated their NDA, but Sonos's nose is out of joint because they're saying, but they basically kind of saw how we did it and so figured out their own way of doing it, which violates our patent. That makes them more dirtbaggery, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> In well, my opinion. I mean, yeah, it, it depends on you know how you feel about both companies. It it always surprises me when a company says, uh, and and th the company being Google in the sense there's Google versus Sonos. I have a lot of Sonos products, but I have a lot of issues with the Sonos business model as well, and that's a story for another time. But for Google to be like, well, sorry, sorry, as a consumer, you're just the one who loses out. We just couldn't come to a resolution. It's like a little eye rolly to me. I'll tell you what I would have to see. I would want to see a bunch of other companies licensing this patent saying, yeah, the terms are pretty easy. It's not super expensive. I don't know why Google is being, I, if I saw that, then yes, I'm going to look at Google and say like, you're being intractable. But if nobody else is licensing this, then maybe Google's got a point of like, well, we thought we had got around the patent. We were wrong. The judge disagrees in the ITC. So we're just not going to do it because I don't know that anybody else does this either. That Google Nest team post as well within their forums telling their users exactly what changes they were expecting with this downgrade, they seem related to like group volume levels for adjusting uh, speakers simultaneously yeah. or using your phone's control to do something right. similar. Yeah, that's what it's really saying. Really basic kind of stuff. So, oh. Yeah, I, it's I'm a sure method, this... right? It's not the code. <laughs> it's not the technology. It's it's the method for doing it. The, and patents uh -huh. always feel like that, right? They always feel like, well, but it's obvious, except 
you can't get a patent. Tech, right. You're not supposed to be able to get a patent if it's obvious. So it must not have been. And uh, Google didn't figure out a way around it. All right, I'm going to stop advocating for the devil now and start advocating for Allison, who always has a good eye for interesting CES announcements that might go under the radar elsewhere. So we asked her to comb through the press releases for some notable notes. Allison, what are some interesting CES things you're hoping to find out more about? Well, I'm just betting there's enough people here that are still searching for the perfect pillow to give us a good night's sleep. Zarema is an app-driven pillow that allows you to set its shape and height to what's exactly comfortable for you. If Zarema detects that you're snoring, it automatically adjusts the height and sort of like tilts your head back to open the airway uh, so that you can stop snoring. And it's got built-in sleep detection, which allows you to track your sleep to see how well it's working. Um, Zarema is made of open cell memory foam and it has a waterproof and antibacterial cover. And it looks pretty interesting to me. It's available now for $250. Oh man, you had me until the price. <laughs> well, That's an expensive the pillow. It's, it's the got automatic elbow pumps. nudge. It's got it's... little pumps and stuff <laughs> yeah. in it that are pumping it up and down. If you're lucky, it's an elbow nudge. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, my Fitbit tracks my sleep and you know, that's a, you know, wearable that I, I wear at night. I know not everybody is into that overnight, but it works for me. Th so this would not be something that I would necessarily buy, but the wrong pillow sucks. We've all been there. Um, and I love the idea of it saying, well, what do you need? You know, what do you need to not only feel the most comfortable, but also help your uh, sleep friend uh, get more sleep? <laughs> I got to say, Steve is very nice. When I'm snoring, he simply lays his hand on my chest and that makes me stop. Oh. So he's very nice about that. I don't, don't need a pillow to do that. But I still thought it was a pretty cool product. Yeah. Another thing I'm always really interested in at CES is baby products. There's been a lot of things that I've found at CES that later on I've seen in the mainstream. And, uh, you know, watching my children with their newborns in the last few years has really highlighted how sleep deprivation is a real problem for parents. They're starting to hit the, you know, hallucinating point with one of the newborns. A company called Cradlewise has an inventive idea that might help keep the baby asleep. It's a smart crib that senses if your baby wakes up via a smart baby monitor that's built into the crib. So you tell it what time you think your baby should be sleeping to. You know, it's supposed to be a three-hour stint tonight. And if the baby wakes up during that time, the entire crib rocks. And it's sort of a... It's hard to describe, not a, not like an old fashioned rocker, but pivoting around a point up above it. So it's sort of rotating and, and moving the, the baby and uh, it'll give you notifications to tell you the baby woke up and what time. And it'll tell you, hey, I got this one. I put the baby back to sleep for you. I did wonder, do you really want a notification telling you the baby's awake? I thought that was all I was to sleep. But <laughs> maybe, maybe you can modify that. Um, the crib can also play white noise or playlists of your choosing. Now, uh, you balked at the price of the pillow, the Cradlewise Smart Crib is $1,500, but I know some people who would lay that hard that hard cash down right now to regain sleep. And that's the crib, too. It's not like an attachment oh, to an thing. existing crib. So, okay. So yeah. That, yeah. I mean, it's still a lot. I mean, but... listen, if you're paying a night nurse, this is this looks <laughs> yeah. like a, a, a deal. The it's hand also a, that rocks a, the cradle is an AI in this case. Exactly. It's got a, it's got a, a bassinet level at first, and then it can go up to 24 months as a full-size crib. So it, it was very pretty, too. I thought that was pretty cool. What about non-sleep items? Well, all right. Uh, <laughs> I guess I was tired when I wrote these notes. When I was a kid growing up in Michigan, snowmobiles were all the rage, but they were gas powered. Now we've got electric bikes nowadays and French startup Moon Bikes is bringing us an electric snow bike. They're ready to go to a range of up to 60 kilometers with an optional dual battery, which is, is pretty good. I, I did have a question, and I again, I haven't gotten to talk to these people yet, but um, I wondered whether that range, how highly affected that's going to be by the amount of snow you're in and how heavy that snow is. I don't know if, you, if you've ever skied in California, we refer to Sierra cement. We have very mm -hmm. wet, heavy uh, snow a lot of times. And so um, that, that was a question I would have if I got to talk to them. Now, a moon bike is three times lighter than a snowmobile, so they show them just hooked on the back of a truck. And I thought it looked really fun in the videos. I mean, I'd probably kill myself because I'm clumsy. But uh, this one is really going to hit your pocketbook. Uh, they're accepting pre-orders at $8,500 and $1,800 for that extra uh, second battery. And if you want a fast charger, that's going to uh, add up to another $480. <laughs> wow. Okay. 
anything for less than a thousand dollars. Okay, okay, let's let's <laughs> let's drop it down. Yeah, but it was cool. It looks really it's fun. cool. You no, you're right. Videos. You're right. It's very cool. I, I'm with looks you. fun. All right. Um, I imagine if you're anything like me, when I was working, I packed a lunch to save money and save time. All the time going out to lunch and just waste a lot of time. Um, I had to say, though, after a while, a cold peanut butter and jelly sandwich got old real fast. But so did fighting for microwave time to reheat leftovers in a microwave maybe of questionable smells. Uh, a company called Steambox has created a self-heating lunchbox that might solve all of these problems. It's a rechargeable system that can heat up three meals on a single charge. Now, this isn't some giant industrial looking uh, box that you have to carry. It's got a beautiful light wood grain lid, and it, it makes me think of like a nice looking bento box, kind of larger than that. Um, I wasn't able to find the dimensions of steam box, but in the photos, it looks to be easy enough to carry and big enough for a reasonable size lunch. Inside, there's an insulated chamber into which you put a metal tray with your food. Now, steam box can be controlled by an app. Of course it can, right. while showing you your battery charge. Steambox is on pre-order for 179 euro, which is around 200 US. So I think that's finally something affordable. Uh, yeah, affordable, uh, but more more affordable. Yeah, uh, and 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 in, in, interesting. I, I this is one I definitely want to test. If you if you were using it on a daily basis, you would mm -hmm. make that money back real yeah, yeah. quick, and yeah, you would right. enjoy your food away from home that much more. I love this idea. No fish microwave, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm I'm with you on that, Allison. Like, you know, it's like it's sometimes you got a microwave stuff, but you're like, what else was in here earlier today? Mm -hmm. Yuck. <laughs> All right. What's it's your last not one? popcorn? All right. My last one. I've only become more aware in the past few years how many people are living with dyslexia. You know, these people manage to muddle through life with this invisible to us challenge to reading and writing. Something called Lily Lamp is a small battery powered personal lamp that emits customizable flashes of light that are almost imperceptible to the naked eye. These flashes make the perception of writing more precise for a majority of people with dyslexia, or so this company says they, that it does. The French developers of Lily say that reading becomes smoother, faster, and less tiring as a result. The flashes of light are customizable through an iOS or Android uh, app. You can order Lily Lamp, uh, let's see, 349 euro, which is roughly the same in U.S. dollars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I want to see some of the more medical vetting on this, but uh, potentially sure. great. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, I idea. do have a friend. If I could get one, I have a friend I could give it to to have her check it out and see what, uh, what it did, mm -hmm. whether it actually does as it says on the tin. Well, I'm sure yeah. it flashes light. But whether it fixes yeah, the right. problem, but whether is that, a real that does what it says, yeah, for sure. Well, thank you so much, Allison. These are great. These are great little finds that I have not. They heard really are anywhere yeah. else. Yeah, across the spectrum. Well, something that you might hear, have heard about recently is cryptocurrencies. Everybody's getting into crypto. Mm -hmm. Last year, last year, remember 2021? It wasn't that <laughs> long ago. We reported that Radio Shack intended to focus on cryptocurrency trading. Some folks thought that was kind of crazy. Other folks said, eh. Makes sense. GameStop just launched a cryptocurrency division to establish an NFT marketplace for game developers. It's also partnering with two cryptocurrency companies to develop games. They use blockchain and NFTs. Ubisoft, Zynga, and Square Enix have all recently announced plans to sell NFTs as well. Even antivirus makers are getting into the fun, so to speak. Krebs on security notes that last July, Norton 360 added an Ethereum mining program called Norton Crypto to customers' installation. Norton LifeLock says that the uh, program is opt-in, so you don't have to do it, got opt-in. It'll take 15% of currencies mined, though, the rest to be kept by the user. Might be worth your time, might not. Your system also must meet minimum hardware requirements, including an NVIDIA GPU and at least six gigabytes of RAM. If you enable the program, it'll work when your system is otherwise idle. So it shouldn't interrupt what you're doing when you're actually active on your system. It will create a wallet and store your encryption key securely in the cloud. Only the user is said to have access to this encryption key. Norton Crypto makes it easy to transfer any coins to a Coinbase account, so they have a partnership there, obviously. Though so transfers will take out a 15% fee as well as gas fees associated with any Ethereum transaction, which vary by day. And boy, if you know anything about gas fees, you know that they are a real... <sighs> I won't say what they are. Mm. They are high. The system launched back in July, but received attention on January 4th when Cory Doctorow tweeted about it. Norton LifeLock not only insists it's opt-in, 
you don't have to do this. This is opt-in, but also issued a statement with instructions on how to remove encrypt.exe if you so desire. If you're not cool with it, not down with it, don't want it on your system, uh, Norton uh, wants to help you out there. However, many users did not like the executable being downloaded at all without their permission, even if it wasn't enabled. They just didn't like it being there. So a lot of people worried about power consumption were worse. Roberts, what are your thoughts? That would be my one concern overall. I like the fact that it is opt-in. That's the way to do it if you're going to foist this on someone. The 15% fee, you know, give or take it. If that's what you want, you can take it or leave it. However, just be aware that they are specifically requesting certain GPU characteristics that imply that it's going to be a GPU miner. These programs will run that graphics card, in particular the memory, harder than any game currently out there. And you have to be aware on certain cards that can be well over 100 degrees Celsius on memory temperatures alone, let alone the increased power consumption. There are graphics cards out there now exceeding 350 watts when they're grinding away. And I, depending on the cost of your GPU, I'm not sure if I trust something like this program from this company to be managing the uh, the health characteristics and looking out for my best end mm. in terms of managing that setup and making sure it's not going to fry my freaking graphics card that may be very difficult to replace in this day and age. I mean, at that at that de uh, level of degrees, you know, 100 degrees Celsius, you know, you can't crank at that for very long before you're in trouble, right? That's the weird part right now. There are certain on the high end of graphics cards today they're using a form of ram called gddr6x it has a list temperature of about 94 c but often imp these implementations i see will well and exceed that uh like 104 even when you're gaming sometimes depending on the cooling setup depending on your room conditions either way just be aware that if you're going to run crypto mining hardware for ethereum it is just gonna push that memory on your graphics card to the limit and be aware that there could be some wear and tear involved. Uh, hopefully they're increasing the fan speeds to keep things a little cooler. It, those kind of back end things that somebody who might be a little more familiar with this kind of project would be aware of. I just hope that they're making that uh, aware to the users in general. Well, Especially the, yeah, I think that's, that, oh, sorry, go ahead, Allison. I was just going to say that the, your typical Norton user is not somebody who's a gamer or who understands what's going on with their graphics goes, oh, I can make some money. Okay, click. And it's true. I, I don't have a problem with them offering this personally. Uh, I, I don't have a problem with everyone saying, great, thanks. I'm not going to use it. Uh, I think I think what Robert brings up is is the key thing is if people look into this, is Norton making it clear what they're getting into? That's that's the part that I do have an issue with is like and and to your point, Allison, these are not necessarily savvy users who know this stuff. So you need to make it extra clear. Like if you turn this on, here are the implications of it. Uh, I see people getting bent out of shape that they have it at all. Just don't use it. Right. It's it is opt in. It's not. It's not opt out. They didn't force this on people. People are getting really nose bent out of shape that the file was downloaded at all. That's pretty normal for software to, if they're offering an option to not make you download it when you select it, to have it there and ready for you. So I don't really have a problem with most of that stuff. It's 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 a it's a thing that I don't think they need to be offering. I don't have a problem that they offered it just because I don't want it. Is it's opt in. You yeah. know, it's it's you don't I'm you don't have to get mad about it yeah. if you don't want to. Hey, well, folks, if you uh, if you agree with me, please let us know on social. I mean, if you disagree, too, I guess that's all right, too. Get in touch with the DTNS audience on our social networks. Daily Tech News Show on Twitter. It's Daily Tech News SH. Just start typing Daily Tech News Show until you run out of characters. Or DTNS Picks, D-T-N-S-P-I-X, on Instagram. <laughs> No CES coverage is complete without Robert Heron's perspective on all the TV and display panel developments that were announced at the show. And Robert, I want to start with one of the hot buzz terms uh, of the show, QD OLED. Uh, can you explain to us in, in, in top level terms what it, QD OLED is? If you think about the OLEDs offered today from companies like LG, they currently generate the picture you see. Each individual pixel is a little piece of OLED material that is glowing when stimulated by electricity. Now, for LG's design, they use a white OLED material, and that pushes through a color filter. 
and each subpixel will be red, blue, green, or in LG's case, they add a white subpixel as well. There is immediate efficiency loss right there when you're transitioning this pure white backlight through this piece of plastic to see the pixels the way you need them to be. Now, what with QD OLED, what they are thinking of doing and what they are and what they have done is simply replace that color filter with a material. One, start with a blue backlight material that is well engineered and very close to where it needs to be, spectrally speaking, uh, in terms of its color coordinate to be good for use in televisions. And then convert the rest of that light, the extra blue light, using red and green quantum dot materials. That's the QD mm. part in QD OLED. Those quantum dot converters are very efficient. And instead of say a 90% loss through a standard filter used on either an LCD TV or an OLED from LG, you're looking at something closer to like 10%, which is just fantastic. That's huge. Yeah. And the design by nature will also be pure RGB. There will not be a white subpixel. So that could imply superior color saturation in addition to already the perfect black level you get from OLED anyway. All right. So, so overall, uh, yeah, I mean, I know QD OLED uh, sort of burned up the headlines uh, as far as TVs go at CES. What what else did you see at CES that is worth noting? One, the distinct lack of actual next generation OLED displays that you could actually put your eyes on. That was kind of a bummer. Yes, we had the QD OLED introduction from Samsung Display, not Samsung Electronics. Samsung Electronics didn't actually show off this next gen display. However, uh, in Sony's booth, they at least announced their product, the A95K, which will be based upon the Samsung display product and available in 55 and 65 inches. That's currently listed on their website. That arguably will be one of the premium TVs for 2022, even though it is currently limited to a max size of 65 inches. LG's display division also announced, although they although they have not actually shown this off yet, is their next-gen OLED technology looking, say, to 2023 and beyond. They're actually using deuterium particles within the OLED materials to create brighter displays that are more robust. De deuterium, like heavy water deuterium? Yes. Wow. <laughs> and that that's kind of crazy. You can Google uh, QLED or OLED.EX, and that's their technology for that. Now, What's heavy all of this, water? Heavy water. It has what? Uh, it's an isotope of hydrogen. So yeah, and, and oh. it's often used in uh, nuclear reactors because the water can absorb radiation. Ah. I want to say it has oh. one extra proton, or an, uh, don't quote me. Uh, yeah, it's something <laughs> like that. If that's not exactly right, yeah, yeah. Oh, but what is also kind of cool is that coming to PC displays, we're having more and more OLED showing up there as well. So uh, LG showed off last year, of course, their ultrafine OLED Pro monitors. They have a new version for this year that will include hardware calibration options and just generally better performance. Alienware is showing off a monitor based upon, and so is Samsung, of course, based upon that QD OLED technology as well. And these are highly anticipated just to nice. see what kind of longevity are they going to be able to pull out of these in a PC environment? Now, LCD televisions will always remain the affordable option and for some of the biggest screens out there. And mini LED LCDs is the trend that everyone has now jumped on board with. This is basically changing up the backlight system on an LCD TV so that instead of using just a few of them and maybe they're extra bright, you're using thousands or in some cases tens of thousands of these to create a more seamless and controllable backlighting system that can produce very good local dimming as well as just punchy bright output when you need it. Now, uh, in the flagship TVs for 2022 from companies like Sony and that beautiful Z9K you can look at right now online, as well as Samsung's QN900B and the Hisense U9 series this year are all adopting this mini LED system that should produce anywhere from two to three. I'm looking at that new Sony Z9K, maybe peaking out at 4,000 nits of light output, which is significant for a home theater display. That would be uh, impressive to say the least. And of course, those examples will be 8K screens. 8K going forward will just, I think, really kind of take over anything, say above 65 inches in screen size. That's where it's most effective including, I have to say, Hisense showed off their latest generation 8K projector using RGB laser technology that they've already pioneered for their award-winning 4K projector that's currently available. 
uh, that design looks fantastic as well. So there is no shortage of, I think, OLED getting bigger and brighter, and in some cases, just simply better. Uh, LG did announce a 97-inch model coming out this year. That's gigantic. And a 42-inch as well. But uh, one final thing I'm seeing across the board for the 2022 lineup is the incorporation of the next-gen TV tuners, uh, a.k.a. ATSC 3.0. And that, if you care, is the system that will basically deliver 4K broadcast video, live mm -hmm. streaming over a potentially cheap antenna. So if that's important to you, the deployment map gets a little more filled in every year. Here in the Bay Area, it's total weak sauce at this point. I don't, last time I checked, we didn't have a single channel currently active, but that's coming and it's built in. And I think that is a key feature that's going to be there. And hopefully, occasionally, people will take advantage of it. Yeah, awesome. my TV's up against a fireplace currently. So it's like there just isn't any OTA stuff happening. <laughs> real quick, no. real quick, um, yeah. Robert. Uh, my mom is in uh, the market for a new TV and she went to Costco recently and was like, those OLED TVs are very nice. If, you, if you're kind of in a, let's say you, you want a new TV, you're thinking of spending... A thousand dollars. You know, where would you point people to? Uh, it. I think it depends on their room environment. Most of all, an OLED would be a great option, but I'm not sure of what you would get at a thousand dollars for OLED. Even mm. the 48 inch model is probably above that budget. And to stay in budget, I'd be looking at something more along the lines of a value TV. Uh, that TCL six series is still going to be a fantastic money saver that gets you something that's bright and punchy supports all the formats and it's really easy to use with the built-in roku system otherwise uh actually there isn't the new 42 inch model if that's big enough you could probably find that for a thousand bucks real soon uh all coming right. from lg as a 4k display at 42 inches i think that will be far more popular as a pc display than it will be for a home theater display yeah otherwise for you know about Twelve to thirteen hundred dollars. That's where you get into the fifty-five inch screen size for OLED, and in a good quality, like their C two. And I think for most living room. rooms, that's what people are going for. Totally. Anything lower than that is yeah, maybe a little small. If I need something as a light cannon to combat room lighting, that's where I'm looking more toward LCDs. Uh, Samsung's premium displays have the most wonderful anti-reflective coatings, and I'll be curious to see if any of that makes it into their new QD OLED des uh, designs or their QD display designs that they'll be bringing out later this year. But uh, Hisense is another good one for their H8, and their even their H7 is a terrific value for what you get out of that TV in terms of brightness, picture quality, good factory calibration, built-in apps that you might actually use, things like that. All right. Well, that's uh, that, that's it for Daily Tech News Show. Those of you on Good Day Internet, stick around, though. We'll be carrying on uh, the conversation. Thanks to our brand new boss, Frank Kim, who hopefully will join us in the conversation later. Frank just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Frank. Woo! We also have a great panel of folks to thank today. Len Peralta, we'll start with you. Let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Sure thing. Well, you know, first off, this this is what I got out of the great information all today. This is what I got out of this story about crypto is, uh, you know, I know I'm a little bit late to the game here, but uh, Radio Shack selling crypto. I think that's kind of fun and interesting. I'm thinking that they're <laughs> probably going to call it Tandy Coin. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're going to need a phone number for the transaction, of course. And uh, you can only buy it in store. So, you can, I mean, you can only buy, use Tandy Coin in store. So, there you go. And then um, eventually you'll be able to use Tandy Coin in their metaverse, Tandyland. <laughs> Tandyland. Yeah. I like that. That I like. Very, very good. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, yeah, this this image is available right now online at my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash land or at my online store at lenperaltastore.com. I also just want to remind people that this is the last Friday I'm going to be on DTNS. I'm not going away. I'm actually going to Thursdays. So uh, Art Prof Thursdays. is Must going to TV. Thursdays. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, Len, we are lucky to have you on any day that works best for you. So uh, look forward to your drawings in the future. Robert Heron, it's not a CES without a Robert Heron roundup. Uh, thanks so much for being on the show with us. Let folks know where they can keep up with the rest of your work. 
Uh, follow me on Twitter at Robert Heron. You can also check me out at avxl.com for my uh, usually weekly podcast. We're getting back on track now for the beginning of the year. And uh, if you want more information about calibration or video services, check out heronfidelity.com. Excellent. Allison Sheridan, also so glad to have you. Uh, your first show of 2022 and not the last, I'm sure. Let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Well, the best place to go is podfeet.com, or you can follow me on Twitter at podfeet. Well, we are live on this show. We keep cranking out, everybody. Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we'd love to have you join us live if you can. We are back on Monday to talk dogs and the physics of computer animations with Blair Bazdrich. Have a great weekend. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Associate producer, Anthony Lamos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scott S. One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Jack Shid, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, and J.D. Galloway. Modern video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A, Acast, Creative Ast Arts, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Trace Gaynor. Patreon support from Stefan Brown. Contributors for this week's show included Patrick Norton, Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, Shannon Morse, and Allison Sheridan. Guests on this week's show included Nate Langson and Robert Heron. And thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this broker. <laughs>